All right, we are back in action, betting you, we call it overtime, because it gets into the depths of the college football slate. We talk about the teams that we didn't get to on the first episode. That is available on this very channel. Of course, if you missed, you want the marquee games, just go watch betting you. But I hope you're here for Arkansas State. I hope you're here for North Texas. I hope you're here for JMU. And we're going to get into all those teams and more. I'm Ben Razza, Matt Kajewski, of course, in the house, sir. What are we looking at when we think about some of the the under-the-radar games? Is this some appetizing potential, or is this an ugly, ugly situation? Yeah, there's some really good games in this area of football. We were talking briefly about, like, conference championships and stuff. Especially in the G5, there's some games that will have some pretty big ramifications towards that if you're looking at futures and stuff. We're at the time of year where we kind of need to be thinking about bowl eligibility. Do teams actually have motivation? It's only two games left in the regular season, which is wild. But there's already a lot of teams battling, like swimming, fighting for their lives for bowls, which we'll get into situationally when it applies. Yeah, exactly. We start to see that picture. Who's in? Who's boxed out? Uh, and feel free to, to bring that up throughout. But let's, if you're ready, I'm ready. Yeah, audience, I think society is ready. Let's get into <laughs> these games. Uh, yeah, let's do it. We start with a, a fascinating game out west. Uh, and I... I really want answers of what the what is going on here. Air Force and UNLV. Uh, I'm a big fan of Air Force, one of my favorite teams in the country. They are a slight favorite here, but w- what's happened to Air Force? Is there is there something that you can point to? Because clearly their season lately has derailed. Yeah, they have something like, I think it's nine turnovers. It's either nine or ten in the last two games. They had six in their most recent contest. And when they get behind in games, they just flat out can't play. I mean, they just don't throw the ball. As much as I like Larry and Jensen Jones, these players are just glorified running backs. So when they get down in games, it's basically they're completely cooked, which has happened in the last two contests, largely because of injuries and largely because of turnovers. But this is a really important game. There's a log jam in the Mountain West. Unfortunately for Air Force and UNLV, these two teams – are five and one. The loser is going to jam, join the log jam of Fresno State, Boise State, and San Jose State at four and two. So just absolutely huge game in this conference. And I gave you guys their conference record. Obviously, Air Force just lost to Army. That's not a conference loss. So they're still five and one there. Larry is hurt. He got injured early in last game. That is the Air Force quarterback. You also had Jensen Jones briefly leave that game with an injury, putting them on their third string, which not not a good situation. At running back, their top fullback, Emmanuel Michelle, didn't play. They didn't have one of their top receivers, Dane Kinnaman. On defense, they already lost Camby Goff way earlier this year, safety with an Achilles. But most recently, they didn't have starting corner, Jerome Galliard, defensive tackle, Peyton Zedroik, safety, C.J. Boyd, and defensive tackle, Jaden Theargood. That's another big reason why Air Force is now losing games. They could stand on their defense, but that's about five starters that have been out. Don't expect good reporting from Air Force. We're not going to get it, and we won't know if these guys return. But I would be surprised if, like, all six of these guys return. So it's a pretty tough game to bet on the Air Force side. When you look at this UNLV team, I think they're by far the healthier team. Just a couple injuries on offense, and they're probably going to get back Jare Williams this game. Their stud safety broke his foot, hasn't played in a long time. He was supposed to play last week, but their coaches came out and said, wanted to be cautious, give him an extra week to prepare. And obviously this is probably the most meaningful game UNLV will play this year outside of a potential conference title berth. They've also had really good play out of Jaden Maeva, 65% completion percentage, nearly nine yards per attempt, awesome rushing ability. The old line is great for UNLV. They're only allowing a 19% pressure rate. And the UNLV defense has been pretty strong. They have a weakness. It's in coverage. They're one or second there. They're 40th against the run against a potential backup or third string Air Force quarterback without one of their best receivers and their starting running back. This is setting up pretty nicely for UNLV. So I actually took them in this spot, even not knowing the Air Force injury situation. I don't think we get enough guys back to really back that team at this point in time. Would you take this? It's come down a little bit. It's still at three. How low are you willing to go? I would take the three. I believe I got four. I can't remember. Yeah, it was at four. It's come down to three. I I, Listen, like I said, I'm a big Air Force fan, but you mentioned, first of all, stylistically, they're not going to be able to exploit 
a UNLV second. It doesn't matter how bad your secondary is. Air Force just not built like that. Got to limit the turnovers. It's been bad losses. Bad losses. These are teams that Air Force should not be losing to. It's hard to really back them right now. Fascinating game, though. That's one to keep. Make, make appointment viewing for that one. I'm not sure I could say the same about this, but you know what? James Madison deserves a lot of credit. Now, they just got them in, like, Tarleton State. I don't even know what they're complaining about, but they were all rejected by the NCAA. You're not going to see them uh, bowling and whatnot, but they might go just straight demolition on the entire schedule. Are they going to get tripped up here? They're a nine-point favorite at home against App State. There's a lot of motivation stuff that's extremely hard to quantify, but we saw it last year when their petition to play in a bowl got denied. I believe they dominated Coastal Carolina in the final game of the year. They now have two games left to string together an undefeated season. App State's played relatively well of late. They're on a three-game win streak, but I, I still don't know if I buy this team. Prior to that win streak, they lost to Coastal and Old Dominion. Southern Miss, that's a weak team. Marshall, that's a weak team. And then Georgia State, I respect. They kind of did kill Georgia State, which is a pretty good data point for them. But you look at this App State team, they're still live somehow to get into the Sun Belt Championship. I think it's unlikely because obviously they, they need to beat James Madison and then Coastal is a head to head over them, but they're not dead. So motivation is still in play for App State. They've been on their backup quarterback all year, Joey Aguilar. I think he just flat out outplayed Berger. So he's been pretty good, 63.5% completion, 8.5 yards per attempt. He has the same amount of big-time throws as turnover-worthy plays. They're both 21. I mean, you, you see these numbers, it reminds you of a college Jameis Winston. This guy is just reckless pushing the ball downfield. But is James Madison really the defense you want that kind of signal caller facing? They're seventh overall, amazing against the run. They're third there. But they're also 12th in coverage. Some of the best defenses in the country. They did have two players somewhat banged up on defense. Jalen Green missed their last contest. He's one of their stud edge rushers. And Taurus Jones, their linebacker, only played 18 snaps, which was a concern to me. But I couldn't find any injury information, so I guess just watch their statuses. Don't think it makes a ton of a difference. This James Madison defense is extremely deep. And then you look on the other side. I mean, James Madison has a potent offense, 41st in total efficiency. Good signal caller. Jordan McLeod has mobility, 4.1 yards per carry. O-line leaves a little bit to be desired, but he's mobile enough to mask some of those deficiencies. They go three wide. You're facing an App State defense, which is 108th in run defense. They're pretty good in coverage, 24th there, but they have a clear weakness, which James Madison can exploit. Ultimately, I think it's a lot of points, and money's coming in on App State. So my approach is to wait. If it gets down close to seven, I'll probably play James Madison. But for now, I'm just going to wait and see if App State continues to take money. Yeah, it's pushed down, not not nearly to seven just yet. Uh, I see eight and a halfs out there. Again, you can bring up the live odds screen on Hot Chopper, but I, we'll, we'll have to monitor. James Madison is an awesome team. I I'm a big fan of them. I'd like to get a position on them. I don't know how good they really are, and we'll probably never know. But they should be able to handle this situation, I think, pretty cleanly. Let's go back out to the Mountain West. You mentioned uh, the log jam, and I believe you used Boise State in there. They got Utah State, three and a half point spread. Is this a, I don't even want to call it a trap game, but do you expect this to be competitive? And do you think that Utah State can pull a minor upset? I think it will be competitive. Utah State's a good Mountain West team, even though they're not in that four and two log jam that might end up playing for a title. Boise's in there, but they have a tough end of the year. This Utah State game's not easy. And then they'll close out against Air Force. And I mean, what a tough finish for Air Force. UNLV yeah. followed by Boise. I Normally, I wouldn't say this. Like San Jose at 4-2, and two, there's a chance they might actually sneak in just having the easiest schedule of this logjam. It's like everybody's cannibalizing each other except San Jose. But anyway, to Boise we go. This team is a mess. They just fired their head coach. And I don't know what to make of this. There was a report this week that... Their stud receiver, McAllister, might come back now. Like reading the tea leaves, is it just like the the head coach that all these guys hate and now your stud receiver wants to return to the team? I mean, what's going on in Boise, Ben? Do you know? I, I don't know. I, I do know that you, you mentioned anytime you've got like late season portal activity like that, it's not a good look. Uh, I think it's probably honestly a worse look for the guy to be like, just kidding, I'll come back, to be honest. But I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'll get right to it. I like Utah State in this game. You could get three and a half out there. 
they can score. We've seen that. They've had multiple quarterbacks uh, at various times. I think they all represented themselves pretty good. And I don't like Boise whatsoever. I know they're playing a little better. I think I'm going to back Utah State in this spot. Yeah, I already bet them. To, I guess aside from the narrative stuff, which you and I can't quantify, but it's interesting to talk about. And I think yeah. they made the right decision. But I have Utah State slightly ahead of Boise in both offensive and defensive efficiency. It's two good offenses, two bad defenses. Actually, I have Utah State 36th in overall offense, Boise at 37th. On defense, Utah State 101, Boise 123. Boise's defense has been atrocious this year. And outside of a couple of cupcakes they faced recently, they've just been hemorrhaging points. They're hurt on defense. Dimitri Washington and Edge, Markel Reed, safety. They also lost Marco Notoriani, uh, one of their stud linebackers who stepped up. Andrew Simpson at linebacker has been banged up. They talked about how much they need him to return this week. He barely made it through any action last time. Time Benefield at safety missed time. So on top of being awful, they out, they're also very injured. Utah State is by far the healthier team here. And you don't really have too many injuries on defense worth noting. Some rotational guys, so I won't even bring them up. But they just named Cooper Legal the starter for the rest of the year, which I love because they kind of had an inability to figure out which quarterback they wanted to use. But Legal's outplayed McKay Hillstead really routinely, and he's a better rusher. So I'm actually happy they made this. Their offensive line's not great, so you kind of want to rely on Legal's legs, at least to get some – pressure relief from the O-line. But again, Boise's 127 to pass, which I don't really see that being an issue to begin with. Only real concern I have is Ashton Genty allegedly is back practicing, and I don't know what the deal is with Eric McAllister. If he returned, I wouldn't have as much interest in this. But I haven't seen anything about him withdrawing from the portal, so I'm guessing he's out. But yeah, I'm with you on Utah State. Yeah, keep an eye on it. Again, a team with a lot of moving parts. You mentioned Lagasse. Uh, Utah State, three in the hook, sign me up. All right, we're going to Tulane now. And I've seen, not that I make this a point, but I honestly, through the whole year, watch a lot of college football. I I basically randomly see probably almost every team. I don't think I've seen Florida Atlantic this year. I don't know a lot about them. I see their nine and a half point underdogs here. What's the deal with the Owls? Uh, Obviously, they got it going on in the college basketball world. Can they cause Tulane any trouble? Oh, I can't wait to bet against them in college basketball. Yeah, I've been I already tried to do that with Loyola. It didn't work. Oh, for one. <laughs> but I'm not quite in the hoop street yet, but we'll get there. Enough. Yeah, this conference stinks, which is probably why you haven't seen a lot of it. Tulane, I think, is a vastly better team. And honestly, some money's coming on FAU unless this is moved back to Lane's direction this morning. So it might benefit you to wait, but I'm fine with anything like under 10 is great. Tulane is pretty damn healthy. They lost their linebacker, Corey Platt, in week one. That's really the only major injury they've had on defense. They've had a couple old linemen in and out of the lineup, Rashad Green and Josh Remitich. Also didn't have Jaquan Jackson, one of their receivers. But they're very deep at that position, so I don't really see this being an issue. Tulane is pretty deep for an AAC team. 38th in total offense, 44th on defense. Their main weakness is coverage. Love that against Daniel Richardson and FAU. They can't throw the ball. Getting to that side... They've been playing with a backup quarterback for almost the entire season. Richardson is a 63% completion. I mean, turnover-worthy plays, big-time throws, not great. Takes a lot of sacks, negative 39 yards. O-line is decent, but he's not mobile, so anytime he's under pressure, there's a high conversion to sacks. It's a 24% pressure rate. The team can't run block either. They're 112 there, so Larry McCammon slamming into the back of his offensive line consistently. FAU does play good defense, which needs to be noted. 34th overall, 15th against the run, 47th in coverage. They're down two starters. Eddie Williams at linebacker, he's missed multiple games. And Dwight Toombs at safety missed their last game. I think Tulane is the sharp side of this, but you can wait, probably get some more value. I'm not buying this FAU team. When they can't score, facing offenses that can run it up on you, that's a major concern for me. And green wave, man, we'll take them. Green wave, uh, nine and a half soul over the board. So anything inside 10, I'm with you. And you can find it at minus 110. No problem there. So good short FAU. No, no problem there. All right. We're about to get to a real, real good game. But I want to say it's a perfect time to mention it because I would want some extra money before I talk about Texas State. And you should, too. If you're in New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, Iowa, Kentucky or Colorado, I got what I just said for you. I got money for you. Straight cash. 
under $50 in bonus bet coming your way. If you're in one of those states, courtesy of Bet365. The link is below. You sign up and you put in 10 bucks. You bet $5. Bet it on your favorite college football game. Why not? Because if you win that bet, you're getting 150 in bonus bets. If you lose that bet, you're getting 150 in bonus bets. A couple minutes work, $150 to the bankroll, and you get access to a great book. It's that simple. You got to be 21 plus 18 in Kentucky. If you have a gambling problem, call 100 Gambler. But do yourself a favor. Again, these offers don't last forever. We've mentioned this for a couple weeks now. We truly don't know. It could it could go on for a couple more weeks. It could be over tomorrow. That's just kind of how the books operate, to be completely honest with you. Great opportunity for those states. Take advantage. Get your money. Uh, and then bet it on hopefully Texas State. Even though these are two of my favorite teams of the year, Texas State and Arkansas State, what a matchup. Uh, it should be a college football playoff matchup. I don't think we're going to get that. So we'll have to settle for a regular season duel with these two just absolute crazy teams. Talk to me. Red Wolves, Bobcats, points all over the board, I would assume. That's what I think. I took it over here. Okay. 59 and a half. Pacing sets up. Texas State 16th in pace. Arkansas State 37th in total pace. Both offenses are good. The main concern I have is, is the defense is actually a surprise for both teams. Texas State is 37th in total defense, and Arkansas State comes in at 55th, which is better than I would have expected. But ultimately, both offenses are efficient. Arkansas State's 59th, Texas State 52nd. And I like the run games, especially for Texas State with Mahdi and Malik Hornsby taking care of the ball. Their offensive line is only allowing a 22% pressure rate, Texas State that is. And they're fairly... That side of the ball, whereas Arkansas also like this signal caller, Jalen Rayner, 58.5% completion, 9.2 yards. He is coming off his worst game by far. Four turnover worthy plays against South Alabama. They lost the game by seven, so it's still competitive. I wonder, my only real concern with Arkansas State is our teams like finally figuring him out. The O line's not great in pass blocking, but they do run the ball well. Jaquez Cross, number of good running backs. Ultimately, it's just a pacing thing for me. Both defenses have shown enough cracks and both offenses I respect. So anytime you get a pace like this, again, Texas State 16th, Arkansas State 37th, I'll look to an over. Yeah, I have no problem with that. We've seen time and time again, uh, both teams' willingness to give the other short fields. I mean, Texas State is a walking turnover at times. All of that stuff can really help uh, overs. I'm there. I love the, like I said, I've been betting both of these teams heavily this year to varying degrees of success. I don't really have a side in this game, to be honest, but I think I'm going to join you on that total and just root for some points. I'm not joining. I don't care where you're going in this game. I have no angle unless you convince me. I want nothing to do with New Mexico and Fresno State. Uh, Fresno State, what is the status of their quarterback? What's the situation here? And did they just roll over New Mexico? Yeah, I, bl I just basically bet this blindly with Mikey Keene getting hurt. Okay. Logan Fife is terrible at quarterback, so I knew this was going to move. I locked it in at 24. I'll buy out of it if Mikey Keene plays. And he probably will because he is a concussion, and concussions aren't real in college football, which is a complete <laughs> joke. So, I mean, he'll, he'll probably play because the protocols are different in college. Apparently, answer a few questions, they just let anybody on the field with a concussion. That That's right. the whole breakdown. I'm betting New Mexico – because Fresno State's backup QB is absolutely horrific. And New Mexico actually is a good offense. They're terrible on defense. They're dead last. But they're 30th in offensive efficiency, amazing O-line, 16th in pass blocking. They can run the ball really well. Fresno does have some cracks on defense, 85th against the run. So you can beat them on the ground. Their offense is solid, but they take a major step back when Mikey Keene's not in the game. So I think you can get value with New Mexico right now. Just buy out of this if Mikey Keene plays. Yeah, there's 23 and a halfs out there. I, I do want to ask you just very quickly, if you get word, and it'll probably move, but like if you get word that uh, Keen is in, any interest in over 56 and a half? Um, I'd have to look at pacing. I don't, I'm not, it's not, it didn't stand out to me and I didn't sure. put it in my notes. So I'm not. No, sure. that's fair. That's fair. I just, New Mexico's defense is stupid bad. It's dead uh, last in the country. Dead last. Yeah, yeah. And UMass is in the country and I've seen that defense. <laughs> So uh, I'm pulling up the pace right now. Yeah, it's, it's been... again, I, I don't think this is a, an angle that I'm I'm looking to take. I just that was the one thing. If if New Mexico gives you a 17 to 24, you're there, I think. Pretty easy. Yeah, I agree with you. Their defense is horrific. So bad. All right. 
let's see what we got going on right here. Uh, where I don't even know what conference this is. I think it's the Sun Belt, but it might be one of those other ones. Where Old Dominion, our boys. That's Sun Belt, yeah. Sun Belt. There we go. Sun Belt, Fun Belt. Them and Georgia Southern link up here. Six points spread. Georgia Southern's been a pretty fun team at times. Their quarterback is a wild man. He's throwing plays all over the place. Talk to me about that clash of styles with a, an Old Dominion team that does it a little differently. Yeah, speaking of like Jameis Winston type quarterbacks, Davis yeah. Brin might lead the country in this. 18 big time throws, 22 turnover worthy plays. When he takes care of the ball, I mean, they're in there with teams like Wisconsin. When he's turning the ball over, they're getting slaughtered and losing to Texas State and Marshall. But yeah, I mean, the efficiency is okay with Brin when you – just ignore turnovers. The O-line's pretty good, just a 21.5% pressure rate. But this defense has shown some vulnerabilities of late. They just allowed 38 points to Marshall. The week prior, they allowed 45 points to Texas State. They do have some injuries on defense, so some of it makes some sense. Daniel Hickman, one of their best corners, he's been missing time. I think that's probably their biggest injury to note. But Old Dominion, they're awesome on defense, 52nd. They are 96th in coverage, which should make you a little concerned. But... Outside of the Liberty game, which Liberty gets everyone, they're going undefeated in their conference. They played really competitively against solid teams and solid quarterbacks. They lost to Coastal by four. That was a game where Ethan Bosco ran all over them. James Madison by three. App State they beat. Southern Miss they beat. Lost to Marshall by six. And they lost to Wake Forest by three points as well. They also beat Louisiana in week two, a healthy Louisiana team who's fallen off because of injuries. This Old Dominion plays at like a high variant style of football. They're pretty run heavy. They're not the fastest team. Actually, never mind. They are pretty fast. They're sixth in pace. But really? Yeah. Sixth overall. Georgia Southern's 29th. That surprised mm-hmm. me. But anyway, so I was wrong there. But this team wins through their defense. And I think that's something that we should look to against Georgia Southern, who's just been volatile of late. Little more injured offense. They haven't had Robert Wright at offensive tackle, OJ Arnold at running back. Marcus Sanders only made it six snaps to their last game. At seven points, it's just a number that I think doesn't make sense. Once you get below six, I have a little less interest. I would try to grab it now. I think Old Dominion takes more money. But anything like six or better is something I'm fine with. Yeah, there's six and a halfs out there um, for you. I, again, not that I'm, uh, you know, reviewing old dominion tapes uh at night but i did not think they were playing that fast at all um allegedly they are yeah no i just pulled it up as well okay that's good to know um yeah give me the points as well a cool game that's one i I hope i get to catch uh maybe some live uh, potential there because those teams there's going to be ebbs and flows in that game you mentioned the way georgia southern at times takes those chances Keep an eye on it. Now we go. Uh, certainly this this game did not belong in the main episode, which, again, if you're looking for, like, the big-time games, Washington, all those teams, we got it available on this very channel. But Oklahoma State uh, was playing really good football, and finally we got it right. They got smoked in the bounce house by UCF, which was nice, a sweat-free win for us last week. I need about five more of those to get even on this team because they've killed me all year. You think Houston trips them up, or is Oklahoma State bouncing back immediately? I don't think Houston trips them up. I think Houston's the worst team in this conference. They just lost to Cincinnati in a game where Donovan Smith threw for 100 yards and three picks, Ooh. lost by 10. And Cincinnati's not good either. So, I mean, we're at the end of the road, I think, for Holgerson. He might get fired. We've had injuries on Houston. Alex Hogan, one of their corners, has been out. They also lost safety Malik Fleming. Matthew Golden, their best receiver, hasn't played. He's got a foot injury. And prior to the absence, we saw Holgerson say basically this was an injury that Golden's going to have to deal with all season long. It's, I don't know if he's dealing with like a fracture or something in his foot, but at this point we might not see him the rest of the way. They, we've, we've seen Donovan Smith get benched. I think that's in the cards anytime Houston takes the field from here on out. The team has a horrific defense. They're 120th, and they're awful in coverage, 119th. And Oklahoma State's still a very pass-heavy team, even with Ollie Gordon being on their offense. So I, I don't buy anything Houston's doing. I think they're they're live to bench their quarterback, and it's a nice bounce back spot for Oklahoma State. Their defense is their biggest problem. We saw that last week. I mean, R.J. Harvey and John Rice Plumley absolutely demolished this defense. 
But I don't think Houston can really exploit that with a lot of their issues at this point. Number one receiver down, who knows with the quarterback. And then, man, Alan Bowman and Ollie Gordon should be able to absolutely bounce back against this team. Just unbelievable matchup advantages for this Oklahoma State offense. I mean, it, even if you look at last week, Alan Bowman played poorly, yes, but he had three interceptions and only two turnover-worthy plays. Like, Leon Johnson, volleyball setting interceptions to defenders. It shouldn't have been as bad as it was. Yes, they should have lost. And you and I bet UCF, so happy that happened. But, I mean, Same. that game got out of control quickly, and then they couldn't just get back into it. And Bowman didn't play quite as bad as the numbers indicate. So I think you've got a little bit of positive regression coming his way, and hopefully they just slaughter Houston. And motivation, Oklahoma State is in the driver's seat to play Texas for the conference title. They're in a log jam at number two, but they do hold tiebreaker advantages, and they have the easiest schedule in this conference the rest of the way, Houston being one of those opponents. So it's all in front of Oklahoma State. They just got to take care of business, man. Yeah, six and a half out there. You are laying a little extra juice, but there's a six and a half on FanDuel. You can jump on that. Also, again, this is just a small piece. I turned on that UCF game, extreme monsoon, super rain. Uh, the game was just out of control from the start. Just the game that got away from them. It, in some ways, even though, again, I was on the other side of that game, I think it's better to lose like that than lose like a crushing heartbreaker or something where you it, it, they just didn't have it. The game got away from them. No big deal. But I want to talk about UCF. Let's see what they're up to. They... Play Texas Tech. Tech, a Texas Tech team that I thought should have lost to Kansas last week. That kind of hurt me, but they did get it done. Credit to them. They're back at home. What do we say? Uh, obviously, UCF not as strong on the road, but can they go in and get this win? I think they can. I think they should be favored in the game. Okay. I mean, for Texas Tech not to just demolish Kansas without Jason Bean, I mean, yeah, I don't know. They, Never heard of him. Yeah, he did not play well either. I mean, just an atrocious showing. But anyway, starting with this Texas Tech team, Baron Morton has been pretty damn disappointing after a lot of promise early in his career. Should have a ton more turnovers than the three interceptions he has. Only six big-time throws, nine turnover-worthy plays, no rushing upside, so he's just been a complete zero at quarterback. If the receivers don't create on their own, he's done nothing for them, which is pretty alarming. He's not facing any pressure. The team is 18th in pass blocking, and he can't run the ball. So I've been pretty disappointed with Baron Morton since a very promising start to his career last year. If they could get Shug back, man, this team would be way better. With Shug, this team played with Oregon. With Baron Morton, this team is like losing to third-string quarterbacks or at least playing with them. The defense is a huge concern, 79th in total defense. They don't really have a strength or a weakness, 75th in run defense, 76, 76th in coverage. We talked last week about their log jam at linebacker. They've had a lot of injuries at that position. So they've been forced to mix and match freshmen. And apparently they don't care about winning games. All they care about is preserving red shirts. Because I won't go through the whole thing again. They've basically been rotating four freshmen at linebacker. And as soon as they hit their four games, benching them and then putting another freshman in there. So I don't have any faith in the run defense, especially. They should have beat, can't, or excuse me, UCF should be attacking these freshman linebackers that continually rotate on the field. And then, man, I mean, are we, how much can we really discount UCF? This team is awesome on offense, 18th. You spoke about the monsoon. Didn't affect John Rice Plumley threw for 299, nearly 17 yards per attempt. R.J. Harvey over seven yards per carry. The defense is okay, 71st. I don't know if Texas Tech can exploit that with Baron Morton under center. And plus, they're a little better in coverage. With a fully healthy UCF, which they are, they got back Townsend at receiver, their offensive line is getting better too. Man, I don't know how we fade this team, especially when you can get them at a number this tight. I mean, you don't need to do a lot to convince me to bet UCF. I've been betting them all year. And when they have a healthy quarterback, been a big fan. There are uh, There is a three out there. I also assume you'd be fine with taking, you know, the plus 115 to plus 120 uh, yeah, on the money line. I took the three, but the, I, the money line is nice too. Yeah, I, I agree. So you have different ways. To structure with them. All right, we got a couple games left. And then, as always, I mentioned every time, if we don't get to a game, if something slips through, Matt underscore Gajeski at DFS on Twitter. We're here. We're happy to help. We want to talk about college football 24 7, and we want to make sure everybody gets uh, all the takes that they need, even if it's with North Texas, which we're about to talk about, and Tulsa, who I think, I think low key uh, is disgustingly bad this year, but they're another team I really haven't seen 
Mean Green, two-point road favorites, another team that doesn't play defense. Uh, what do we expect in this game? A, a lot of points. Okay. North Texas is eighth in pace, Tulsa's 32nd. And both teams are horrific on defense. North Texas is 107th. Tulsa is 111th. On offense, both teams are good. North Texas is 42nd. We know this. They have an awesome quarterback in Chandler Rogers, who's having one of the best years of any signal caller in the G5. And Tulsa's had to use multiple signal callers this year, largely due to injury. But they got some pretty good play out of Kirk Francis, who was their third stringer to begin the year. He started last week. And this team gave two a run for their money. They only lost by two points. They are a team that plays fast and they morph their offense to the strengths of their team. They've been pass heavy in the past when they've had some of these backup quarterbacks. They've gone run heavy. With Francis showing some promise, I think they might take the ball to the air a little bit more. So it really comes down to just that. Pacing is amazing. Both defenses horrific and both offenses have shown a pulse. That meaning Tulsa primarily because North Texas has been solid all year. I'll take the points here. I know it's lofty at 68, but I mean, you can just run through some of the box scores and see how these teams play. North Texas just played SMU 45 to 21, UTSA 37 29, Memphis 45 42, Tulane 35 28, Temple 45 14. And on the other side, it's been pretty up and down for this Tulsa team before. They allowed 33 to Charlotte, 69 to SMU, 42 to Rice. I mean, just tons of points in these games, so I'll take it over. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of North Texas. It's just one big play after another on both sides of the ball. Uh, and this is a competitive game. It looks like it should be back and forth. So another greasy over for us, but I can get down with that. Why not? Um, all right. Duke, Virginia. Better basketball game than football game, but we get what we get. Uh, we got a three and a half. A lot of, a lot of these close road favorite type games. On this slate, Duke is a three and a half to four point road favorite. Virginia at times has shown some fight. What's the status? Who's playing quarterback for Duke? I feel like I have to ask that every week uh, to make sure we know. Yeah, I don't actually know. These okay. games were all requests. Yeah. And I uh, I got a couple big time requests. So I'm sorry. I'm putting in a personal Big Ten West betting ban the rest of the year. Unless one of the teams is getting 10 or more points. But I am no longer betting that conference. So I saw Northwestern, Purdue is a request, not going to talk it. <laughs> anyway, this game was a request. I don't know who's playing quarterback for Duke because Riley Leonard's, I think, out for the year with the toe. Henry Bellin has an upper body injury, and they've been using third stringer Grayson Loftus. He can't play any more games if he wants to preserve his red shirt. So I'm actually not sure what Duke's going to do if they try to rush back Bellin or something. Ultimately, I think it's most likely that Loftus plays. Just, I mean, at some point, you have to forego the red shirt if you don't have enough guys to play the quarterback position, which is kind of where they sit right now. And if he plays, I do have interest in Duke. So it's going to be one I end up waiting on to see against Virginia. But this Duke team, I still think, is pretty good as long as you can get competent quarterback play with Leonard. I mean, this team was in there with some really good opponents. They beat Clemson, tight with Florida State until the very end. And then obviously they've been getting clobbered recently. The North Carolina game was way closer than it should have been. Like props to Loftus for getting them to 45 points. But North Carolina also kicked six field goals. So, I mean, huge offensive production from North Carolina. But on the Virginia side, you have a bunch of injuries as well. Tony Musket is going to be a game time decision. I would rather he misses. Like this Virginia offense gets in their own way by playing Tony Musket over Colin Drea who's just a much better prospect. And I originally, I think they were trying to preserve Cole Andrea's red shirt, but then Musket got hurt a second time, so they needed to put him out there. Red shirts burn, so I mean, this shouldn't be a concern anymore. But the coaching staff has also been very vocal about starters don't lose their job to injuries, which is complete nonsense. So I don't know what they're going to do at QB. Otherwise, on defense, they've had some injuries. Cam Butler's only played in four games. Dave Harrard missed their last game at safety. This Virginia team is still bad. 128th in total defense, 133rd against the run, 93rd in coverage. They're only 91st in offensive efficiency for some of the, I guess, good games they've had. But, I mean, this team is still awful. Duke is 46th on defense, 20th in coverage. All Virginia does is pass. And then their offense is 93rd, I think, largely due to injury. So if we get Loftus, basically as long as we don't get Bellin under center, I'm going to play Duke. Okay. It's going to be a wait and see. 
yeah, wait and see again. Uh, we'll see how this line shifts. You can always uh, make sure, just make sure you're getting the best thing. This is totally free, by the way. If you ever want to go to the odds screen, just go to odds and click this and you are in. If you want, of course, I always get this request and I've been doing it more because I love the people. We appreciate it. Hit the like button uh, if, if I am doing this for you. I'll give you a little sneak peek. Positive EV bets uh, showing up. This is where the money can be made uh, with Odd Chopper. If you're interested in this, of course, the link is below. Fully customizable. You see some hoops in there. You see all different things. It updates in real time and it's fully customizable. So you just say, okay, I just want to know about NBA. And you know what? I don't have every book. I just have these two. Okay, boom. Uh, and then how much should I bet? Well, okay, I've got this much in my bankroll. Tells you optimal bet size. Shows you why this is valuable right here. It's all this simple. Uh, it's such a fun tool. It's such a powerful tool. I want you guys to experience it week, month, sign up, test it out, and, and see if you get some improvement in your betting process. I really believe that you will, but also make sure you're just shopping uh, at the very least. Let's get to this final game. Syracuse is an absolute, uh, they're, they're kind of a mess. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Maybe a regime change there. Say it isn't so, but I don't know what they have left. I haven't been able to short this team because I'm in New York all the time, but there are six and a half point underdog to Georgia Tech, who I have bet a lot this year. What do you see here? I wanted to bet an over. Okay. Pacing lines up well in this game. Both defenses. Well, Syracuse defense is actually decent. Georgia Tech's defense is horrible. But man, Syracuse, I do, I do not know what they're going to do. They just had the weirdest game plan last week where they only passed the ball like 13 times. And they did so with a bunch of different players. Garrett Schrader threw five passes. LaQuint Allen threw three. And Dan Valari, their tight end, threw five. Just like... Wait, what? Go watch that Syracuse game. Like, weird. They were lining up Garrett Schrader at receiver and basically turning into some sort of glorified wildcat offense. So the I biggest thing say Del Rio, whatever is, what's his name? Del Rio, Del Wilson. I thought you were going to say he came in. No, he didn't play a single snap. He sucks, so that's good. He yeah, I know, but those other guys aren't quarterbacks, so I'm a little confused. Well, I think a big misconception in football that head coaches don't understand is when you have no good quarterbacks, you're playing 10 on 11, especially if your quarterback can't run. Schrader can, which is positive, but like the New York Giants and Tommy DeVito, he can't do oh, anything don't, correct. Don't get so me you, started. You can check the tapes, my friend. I hear yeah, that. You can, you can check them on me too. You can go back to last year's tapes and talk, listen to us on betting you talking about how bad he was with Illinois. But I mean... So rather than play 10 on 11 with a terrible quarterback who can't run the ball, you at least give yourself 11 on 11. Like Air Force is smarter than the New York Giants. Anyway, that's we're not talking about the New York Giants and Tommy <laughs> DeVito, used car salesman of the future, employee of the month. But anyway, the Syracuse offense completely morphed. So now I question like their pacing stuff. Like are they going to run the ball like Army, Air Force, and Navy? They did last week. And I – that's really the only concern I have because if they go back to a normal, decent offense, the pacing in this game is awesome. Georgia Tech's defense stinks. Georgia Tech's offense is awesome. So maybe they should even be able to move the ball on a Syracuse team that's been okay on defense. But yeah, man, I, I think this is a great live betting spot. It's not available to me. But if you see Syracuse doing these dumb offensive weird plays, like I would hit an under. If you see them running normal offense in the first drive, I would look to an over on this, which is a really weird game. Oh, I'm also, have... both teams five and five. The winner gets Ooh. to bowl eligibility. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Jordan Tech actually scrappy battled for me this year. Got over <laughs> the win total. Thank God. But uh, I, I, I have to see this now. I'm going back to watch Syracuse last week. I have to see how that's possible. <laughs> Dan Valari, five pass attempts, tight end. That is something. Uh, he also was the... running the ball too. Like Valari, I didn't know he was so athletic. Yeah, I, I didn't know that either, but I, I just – really? Okay. Okay, you know what? That's the information that you get here on betting you over time. That's why we do the show. I'm learning along with everyone else out there. That is outrageous stuff. But let's get to the best part of this show where we recap what we got going on again. Maybe you took that bet 365 money. Maybe you've been making money with Odd Shepard Premium. Maybe you got your own money, all the money. A couple bets on the board. What are the priorities for this slate? Mike. I guess my two favorites are going to be UCF plus three against Texas Tech 
and right. Oklahoma State minus seven against Houston. I think those two were kind of in a tier on their own. If I was to rank a third, I would do UNLV plus four. Okay. Yep. Got you. I got not against San Jose State. You see what's going on here. Put this on the board. All right. Where would I go? I'm going to add in one more decisions decision. Oh, I know. Actually, not a decision. I'm going with the over in the Texas State game. I love that spot. Both those teams don't play defense. You mentioned it. You broke it down. Honestly, I'm going double over. We're going five pack. North Texas over as well. Uh, That is another game. Both of them should be outrageous pace, uh, efficiency, big plays, turnovers, everything that you could ask for. There we have it. A bunch of bets on the board. Again, I'm just using DraftKings right here. Make sure you shop these numbers, these half points and these totals, these hooks. Extra five cents here, 10 cents there. It makes all the difference in the world. Make sure you secure that value and make sure you get the best number possible. Let's cash some tickets. Again, Matt underscore Gajeski on Twitter, Jazz Raz DFS on Twitter. You can always find us here on the Odd Shopper channel. We appreciate you guys. Bowl season will be here soon enough and we will be prepared, ready to go. But in the meantime, you know where to find us. Let's have a good week 12. Let's cash some tickets and do it all again. Close out the regular season strong for me, for Matt, and for all of us. Good luck and enjoy. And we will talk to you next week.